Hello, everyone, and welcome to the TRT and Hormone Optimization channel. My name is Danny Bossa. I'm joined with uh, one of my esteemed guests here and a great friend, Dr. Jordan Grants from Texas. Howdy. How are you, Jordan? Very well. And we've got Gil. He's a biochemical researcher, director of several uh, men's health clinics. How are you, Gil? Doing well, thank you. Great. So this uh, video is going to be a little interesting. There are several doctors, obviously, all over the planet that have their own practice. They have their own way of doing things. Uh, perhaps they have their own Facebook groups as well, or maybe they have their own YouTube channel and discuss their own methods and, and, and procedures and, and, and strategies and whatnot. And we're okay with all that. And we, frankly, all three of us have probably watched a lot of these videos from all different types of people getting different perspectives. Different um, and all, you know, all, all, is, uh, all is fair there. Um, however, we do occasionally get some uh, I won't bring up any names, uh, mostly by the uh, suggestion of uh, Jordan and Gil, um, where they will, for example, come into our Facebook group, uh, take screenshots of some of the content we post there, post it in their own, and pick it apart saying how, how silly it is, or make comments on our own YouTube videos, or make perhaps videos of their own on YouTube saying as how all the doctors I've had on this channel I don't know what they're talking about, and only this particular one doctor knows what he's talking about. We should all listen to him. Um, I don't really subscribe to any one particular way of doing things. I think there's probably a lot of different ways of doing things, but there are some things that I really stand firm on, and I know guys like Jordan and Gil uh, stand firm on them as well. A lot of the doctors I've had on are the same thing. There are some things that we just won't budge on because the literature is so overwhelming uh, that it's just you just can't you can't deny it. Um, so I wanted to kind of uh, do a little picking apart myself of some silly, ridiculous, uh, crazy, insane stuff that I've been seeing online by one particular doctor, whose name again I won't mention, um, and uh, discuss it because apparently the claim has been made that uh, me, myself not being a physician, uh, I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, even though everything I've been taught was taught to me by physicians. So I thought I would bring a physician uh, on and he can hit some of these topics. And uh, Gil, having an extremely extensive uh, experience on this, uh, can contribute. So uh, I made a little list of some of the statements being made, and uh, we're going to throw in some uh, little video clips as well of uh, some of the things I've seen, just to, we know that they've been, they've been seen. And uh, one of them is uh, a, the cookie cutter protocol of all patients are given HCG by default and topped up with daily testosterone, which I think is silly. Guys, what do you think about that? Should all patients be automatically be given HCG, where HCG is the foundation of their protocol, topped up by a little bit of daily testosterone? Jordan, why don't you uh, start with this one perhaps? So. As a cookie cutter approach, I would say no. Um, I think we all agree that guys want to want to maintain fertility. This is if their testes are still functioning. Um, if they want to maintain fertility, staying on HCG is smart. Um, if they're concerned about testicular atrophy, if they're concerned about their ejaculate volume, I think it's fine. Uh, as a cookie cutter approach, doing uh, more HCG than and then just a little testosterone, I see no benefit in that. Um, they've done studies on HCG monotherapy alone and the changes from baseline testosterone are not very significant, not anywhere close to where I'd say it would be become a resolving of their symptoms. Um, the, you know, Dr. Chrysler was a big proponent of this and a lot of the guys on uh, Excel Mail, the backfilling the pathways and, I haven't seen good research on that at all. I've looked, I really have, because I was fascinated by that. Um, I started doing a lot of digging into how LH affects adrenal hormones. And they've done studies, not really in men, they've done them in women, premenopausal, postmenopausal, and saw no changes in the adrenal hormones. They did see maybe a change in DHEA sulfate only, and it wasn't that much. A lot of concern I've seen is for constant overstimulation of the LH receptor leading to excess other adrenal hormones, corticosteroids that might cause an issue. They, they see that in some pregnant women and pathologies, but whether that happens with HCG, I don't know. So I'm kind of, um, I'm not sure on that one. Um, the whole, 
the reasoning of this guy, this, this gentleman, this doctor, um, is that we have to have LH stimulation because that's how we are made and we need to constantly uh, replicate physiology. Taking HCG is not replicating it. It's not LH. It actually suppresses the pituitary. It does stimulate LH receptors, but does it stimulate them in the exact same way as LH? We don't know. I mean, it's no different than a non-bioidentical hormone. Just because they've found LH receptors all over the body does not mean that they have to be constantly stimulated. Um, you know, his reasoning kind of backfires on himself because there's gonadotropin releasing hormone receptors in the brain and you're not giving people gonadotropin releasing hormone. You're not replacing that. There's FSH receptors in a lot of places in bone. You're not giving HMG or, or recombinant FSH. You're not doing that. So you can't use that as your reasoning is that we're trying to replicate physiology. If you were going to do that, you'd have to figure out exactly how the body pulses LH and then try to mimic that. If you're just taking HCG daily or three times a week, you're not mimicking physiology with that. So, you know, I, I don't have a problem with people taking HCG. I think a lot of guys, some guys do feel better with it. I see it. We see a lot of guys in the groups complain that when they start it, they feel worse. So I think it's very individual. I think if you want to add it and you feel better and you have better orgasms, better penile sensitivity, that's fine. I think a lot of those guys are never optimized first on their testosterone and then get on the, you know, and so I, I like to be a, I'm a minimal variable kind of guy. So I would rather get somebody dialed in on their, on their testosterone first and then if they want to explore HCG, I think that's fine. But the, the micro dosing, I mean, the doses this guy talked about, five milligrams a day of testosterone combined with HCG, I, I don't see that being working. I mean, I don't know. Maybe he's got patients that feel great on that, but I, I bet they could do better. So. I haven't heard from any so far, but <laughs> Gil, uh, what's your take on that? Okay, so in the big picture, I wholeheartedly agree with Jordan on this. Um, it is not a blanket policy. It is not something that every patient must have. In fact, I'd venture a rough guess that probably 70% of our testosterone patients do not use HCG, maybe 30% do. Um, let's look at, without spending an hour on the topic, let's look at the top benefits of HCG and where it is helpful, and then cut that down into a specific uh, pool of patients. It is extremely beneficial in preventing testicular atrophy because you're mimicking the luteinizing hormone to keep the latex cells active. Um, therefore, the 20 to 30% atrophy that some guys, and I say some because not everyone experiences it, uh, with cypionate is going to be prevented. And I think the reason that most guys, or, or, or probably half the guys do not experience atrophy is because if they are a strong primary hypogonadism case, they have already achieved the level of atrophy prior to starting TRT by the mere fact that their testicle function has ceased years ago, they just have a notice because it's been done over time. Whereas when you begin sipping it, it's more like an on-off switch. So some of these guys may say, well, I haven't experienced it because you're already at that state. And in terms of ejaculate volume, yes, we have seen patients on sipping it only over the course of a year or two where they do begin to lose that. They experience shorter orgasms and less dramatic orgasms. Um, penis sensitivity is another one. Yes, HCG has been uh, shown. Again, I don't know if there are any uh, clinical studies on this, but anecdotally, it has been reported to improve that. Um, libido, I think there is something to be said about endogenous testosterone produ uh, production in the testes that improves libido. I don't know if the um, systemic serum testosterone increase is as impactful on libido as endogenous testosterone would be when it can be, you know, tapered up. The problem I see with the protocol that this physician is referring to is he's using HCG as his base and he's using cypionate as a so-called supplement where the HCG in and of itself, especially in an older population uh, who are primary, they're not really ever going to achieve optimal levels with HCG and trying to top that off with a small dose of cypionate like Jordan states, is never going to optimize a patient. It's not going to offer symptom resolution, and it's probably not going to look it on paper either. The cypionate should be a lifelong replacement. The HCG should only be utilized for the benefits that we discussed. In fact, I'll go out and say HCG should not even be considered as a topping for your testosterone numbers whatsoever. Yeah, I agree. It's right. a whole separate, completely separate pathway and separate things you're trying to deal with. So on my side of things, I could say that a lot of uh, cases where I saw guys saying, I feel great with HCG, I feel great with HCG. And then I asked them, well, how much testosterone are you taking? And they tell me, and I'm like, have you ever tried 
ditching the test, the, the HCG and just increasing your test dose to compensate to get to careful more or less the same serum levels. Increase your dose. Just <laughs> don't increase your dose. Um, but then they do just say, well, I'll, I'll do an experiment and I'll try it out. And oftentimes I've had guys come up to me and says, this is so weird. I now have the same testosterone levels I had before. So I figured out what dose of test I would need to achieve the levels I had with testosterone HCG. I have the same levels I had before now. And I feel better now than I did then. And there was a doctor I had on this channel a while back who said, I can get some, a patient's um, serum levels jacked up pretty high, even just on Clomid or HCG. Yeah. They're getting their natural, but they will never feel as good as they would with exogenous tea, exogenous tea. I don't know why. Clomid. For some reason, that exogenous tea. And that's a, a perspective that one doctor had. Is it accurate or not? I have seen Danny, anecdotal Clomid. evidence of that. Clomid is a whole another unicorn because now you're blocking the estrogen receptor. So the serums uh, acting in the body are completely different than gonadotropins. Uh, and that's a whole other slew of, uh, of issues to deal with. So I would not put HCG and Clomid in the same sentence at any point. No, I understand they're different. Yes. Yeah. 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 But it, it basically the argument was you will never feel as good with naturally occurring levels of test as you will with exogenous levels of test is the claim that was made by this one doctor. I would probably agree with that. I mean, I would say never. That's a strong word. And we or often. Yeah. Oftentimes. Yeah. I, I definitely seen that with Clomid. I totally agree. But like I said, the studies shown with HCG as monotherapy, these guys didn't have a great response as far as their, their numbers would have been normal. Yeah, they might have gone from 300 to 500. And a lot of doctors go, okay, you're good. But that's not what we're about. We're about, and I know somebody makes fun of us saying optimization, but it's true. And that doesn't mean just increasing your dose to super physiologic levels. It, it means symptom resolution. It doesn't mean basing things off lab ranges of sick people. So, yeah. There are, there brings, are times while I am not, I'm sorry, I'm not a fan whatsoever of ATG monotherapy as an indefinite end all. There are times where it may suffice. And the two specifics are, if someone comes in symptomatic, they are, let's say, in their mid-20s. Perhaps they led a lifestyle that wasn't conducive to optimal hormone level, um, but you do see good testicular function. You may try an ATG monotherapy for short term, possibly, possibly followed by a CIRM to give them a fair chance at kickstarting so that they're not put on a lifelong journey of TRT, you know, prematurely. Um, the other time is when you have a patient who's abused androgens, he's suppressed, and you want to try to kickstart him, HCG will be a nice kickstart for the testicle function prior to putting the serum in. So those are the only two times I would use HCG without the presence of a testosterone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is a totally different context than TRT and the patients we're talking about. I agree with yeah. you. I think that's worth it. Monotherapy is not TRT. It, it just, it isn't. Right. 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 Um, so this issue about the numbers where you're bringing up uh, 500, like, oh, we're fine. Uh, that's another point to be hit. Um, this particular physician, Views TRT, he goes, it's testosterone replacement. He says we are replacing testosterone in order to achieve normality. He says, all my, my end goal is that for everyone is to be normal. Take well, on that, guys. I'm going to let Gil tackle that because he, uh, when we were off air, yeah. he, he went great on yes. that. So. Gil, we'll go right. on that one. So, <laughs> okay. Normal is a social term. Normal is not a scientific term. Uh, science is absolute, right? Math and science are absolute. If I tell you 10, both you and Jordan can close your eyes and picture 10. You can count to 10. If I say normal to Danny and I say normal to Jordan, you're left to interpreting what that means. So number one, when you have variables like that, there's no more, there's no more absolutes. Number two, even if there was an absolute, like a number, like a range, right? Let's just not use the word normal. Let's say lab core is between 264 and, and 950, whatever, they keep shifting that scale. First off, you have to understand that there's a tremendous difference between being at 270 and 850. We know this. I mean, heck, if you're earning $25 an hour or $80 an hour, would you say there's a difference in your lifestyle? How can we consider both average income, right? So you know, when you translate the hormones into money, people start to understand these numbers are complete ludicrous. The next problem here is that these lab rangers are derived from a pool of people. 
do I want to be normal when I'm being compared to a pool of symptomatic and presumably sick individuals who are coming and requesting a test? Because you don't see many young people run into their doctor and saying, can you check my testosterone level? You know, I know I, know I got a scholarship to throw a football and I know I'm 23 years old, but can you please check my levels? No, these are older guys. These are, are presumably uh, post andropause guys. And these are guys who are clearly symptomatic for low T, which is why they're being ordered these lab tests. So these labs are getting these numbers and they're saying of the 5 million guys this year who we've tested, here is the lowest, here is the highest, and here is the median. And then we're expecting the entire population to fall within this range. So the minute you're down here and you cross that line into the lowest of the low, you're normal and have a nice day. So numbers are that. But we're not robots. We're people. We have a life. We want to feel well. We went to an office because we had symptoms. And until you resolve my symptoms, you have not fixed my issue. Okay? To tell me your labs look great, have a nice day, is not symptom resolution. And it's not going to be a proper way of treating a patient. Jordan? Yep. So I'll just kind of, I totally agree with all that. Um, and there's good work coming out of a lot of people now on androgen resistance and that the numbers don't tell much of the story. And when the, the science is still, I think, kind of early, but they're looking at, you know, CAG repeats and their DNA and they're looking at uh, megalin receptor and issues with that and people who their levels may be fine, but they're symptomatic and they're given a trial of testosterone and they feel better. And it's happened enough that it's not just placebo. And I've seen it in guys. Um, we've got a guy in our group, um, uh, I'm not going to name his name, but um, he wouldn't mind it. But he, nobody would probably treat it, treated him. His total was, I can't remember what he started out at in the six or seven hundreds, maybe higher, and he had symptoms. And he's been treated and to get his free tea up, and he feels better. Um, so you have to look at androgen resistance. I think it is a real thing. Um, you know, we don't know yet how EDCs are affecting that, all these environmental chemicals. But the lab range, it's just another tool. It's more just for doctors who. I don't know. I don't want to say they can't think outside the box, but they just, they're, they're good with lab ranges and other aspects of what they do. So they see these hormone numbers and if it's red, it's bad. If it's black, it's, it's normal and we don't need to treat you. And we see enough guys where that just doesn't fit. And optimizing someone is also the same thing. You're not, it doesn't matter as what the absolute number is. It matters when do they feel better to a point. I mean, you can't, their expectations also matter. I mean, if they think they're going to never be tired and never be fatigued and never have a weak erection again, it's not, it's not about that. But when the majority of their symptoms go away and we see that, I see it all the time to get back in three months, six months, a year, how you feeling? Feel great. You know? Okay. You're good. You know? And it, I don't know. It's, it's not rocket science, honestly. It's really not. Um, you know, Dr. Morgan Taller out of Boston recently put a paper out and I've linked this on our group about questioning the AUA guidelines um, and, uh, they talk more about symptom resolution, treating men based on symptoms and treating them not about a specific number. And I think that's important. And so I think Dr. Carruthers, I can't remember if he's out of Australia or the UK has talked about androgen resistance. And, um, I think Morgan Teller may have written the forward to his book. Um, so there's a lot there and we can't just base things off normal ranges of sick people. Um, there was a chart at one point of age-based testosterone normals. And I mean, even a guy in his, for theirs, their levels were huge. A guy in their seventies or eighties was supposed to still have a level of 700, you know, was that, so they obviously, you know, it was interesting. They found some healthier guys to do their study with. And we don't see, I mean, I'm seeing late 20 year old now with, you know, levels in the three hundreds or, or mm -hmm. 200 symptoms. So. Mm -hmm. I'll throw in a little bit of, of mine is, you know, when we even talked about this right before we started recording, you know, a guy that's got, you know, total T of 800 and I'm using total T just to make this simple, but total T of 800 and it was his doctors. I feel like crap. He goes, well, you're not, your, your total T is 800. You're, you're at the top of the range. You're, you're fine. It's not that. What if this guy had natural levels of 13 or 14 or 1500 when he was in his twenties and now they've dropped down to 800. Yeah. He doesn't feel well at 800. There's a lot of guys that do great at 800, but he's, he's now symptomatic. So what right. do you do? Do you base the whole thing on, well, it can't be that because you have this number. This is another thing that this physician says. He goes, the guy's labs came back and his numbers were perfect. And that just drives me nuts. Yeah. What are perfect numbers? I would love to know what the perfect number is that applies to everybody because then we could just close up shop. 
We can close down the YouTube video thing. We can close down the form and just leave, go to Facebook group. And it's like, your number has to be this and your E2 this and your DHT. These are perfect numbers. So get your numbers here. You don't even need a doctor. You just, yep. you know, play around with those to get back and you're fine. And that's it. Yeah. It's Danny, just I, not I that simple. Can answer. Not that simple. I, I can answer this very, very simply. The perfect number for testosterone is equal to the perfect amount of salt on your french fries. That is the just, answer. Just right. Okay? There you go. It's individualistic. Totally lot. The bottom line is what tastes best to you, what makes you feel the best. Yeah. Correct. If you find symptom resolution at 550 and all of the other effects of this treatment are kept at bay and you're only experiencing benefits without long-term detrimental sides, there's your sweet spot. If yeah. that number happens to be 1300 for another patient, so long as we can maintain longevity without detrimental side effects, there is his sweet spot. So there is no number, and this is why this quote-unquote normal has to stop. The problem here, and I'm sure Jordan can confirm, even though he's a specialist, he knows that primary care physicians, they see 40 or 50 patients a day. And if they're going to spend seven or eight minutes in a room and they got to read all these charts and dictate them at the end of the day, they're not reading the labs. They're going down the flag list. And if you're not flagged, then you're going to get a call from the nurse the next day saying, your labs came back and everything's normal. Yep. See you in six months. Now, if your testosterone is one point over the bottom of that range, you're normal. Yep. And that is why all these patients that come in from PCPs, oh, I had my testosterone checked and it's all good. Is it? What's the number? I don't know. It's normal. None of them know what the number is. All they know is I'm symptomatic, but my doctor said I'm normal. This is the problem. What we do is we go into this subspecialty of looking at the specifics of the whole picture, looking at the symptom. We have every patient fill out an ADAM score, okay, so that we can make sure that we're resolving all of the symptoms. And not all of them are TRT related, although some of them are, but we want to give them symptom resolution for all of those questions that they're checking off yes to. And this is the problem with PCPs trying to step out of their box and treat things that, number one, they have no understanding of, and number two, quite honestly, they don't have the time to sit down and go over. Yeah, yeah I totally And agree. I could take this even one step further. When I first saw an endocrinologist, I saw the head endocrinologist in the Montreal General Hospital. I'm from Montreal. Um, went to get my labs done with, with her. She checked my testicles because she wanted to make sure they weren't atrophied. And she goes, oh, you have normal-sized testicles. Well, that's good to know. I said, maybe it's the fact I'm Italian. I don't know, but she says, yeah, normal-sized testicles. Do you have children? Yes, I have children. Okay, well, chances are you're fine. So you're fine. So you basically, you felt my nuts. I have kids, must be fine. Cool. All right, well, let's check what the labs, because I don't think I'm fine. Two weeks pass, I haven't heard from her. So I call her up. I send her an email. I said, so what's the spirit? She says, you're fine. I said, well, what's my number? And, and I calculated the number she gave me to NGDL, and it was at 220. And I'm like, but 220, but that's well below the range. And she goes, yes, but it is not significantly enough below range to, to uh, warrant treatment. She says, you're just slightly below the normal clinical range. Wow. I said, there's people 100 years old that have more testosterone than me. And I was like, you know, 35 at the time, I think, when I went to get checked. So that and just... That's a, and that's, and not knocking her, but that's a, the top endocrinologist at a hospital. Yes. Okay? And I see this yes. kind of stuff. And yes. not, just with, not just with hormones, but you, you just have to find the right... You have to find a doctor that knows what they're talking about. It doesn't matter if they're the top because that just may mean they do a lot of research or they've got a lot of residents doing research and they get their name out there. It doesn't mean they are great. And yeah. I've sent people to UT Southwestern in Dallas, which is a top tier place in the country and have heard back for, and this isn't really with urology, but other things. And um, some of the things they were told are just insane. And I said, go get a second opinion, go somewhere else. I'll say, I mean, especially with endocrinology, it's very hit or miss. Um, so always question your doctor, don't be afraid to do that. Don't be afraid to get a second, third, or fourth opinion if you're not comfortable with something they're telling them. If you know that what they're saying is wrong, and this is not just with hormones, but just go That's go right. elsewhere. And you're, you're the you're the patient. You're you're the customer of that doctor, and don't be afraid of offending them or, or walking away. So. Mm -hmm. I filmed a video. I just, I'll just bring this up because it's it's very related. But I filmed a video yesterday uh, that got posted, and during the video, I was just kind of winging it, like I was doing completely <laughs> prepared in every video I ever do. But I came up with this cool analogy. It's like it's kind of like you're getting into the shower. You turn on the hot water and you wait a little bit. We'll give it some time. You feel it like 
and then it's a little too low, bring it down and go up, up, and that's a little bit too hot. And you go in like, yeah, and you ease your way into it. Like, yeah, this is my temperature. This is where I feel good. I'm not gonna measure the, the temperature of the water. There's no person on the planet that's gonna say, yeah, but your temperature is not the right temperature to be. I'm like, but this is the temperature that for feels you. good to me. And I may even alter it halfway through my shower and decide I want it to be hotter, I want it to be colder. And there's nobody that's gonna tell me what temperature it is, just like there's no one that can tell me yeah. what my best dose is. I have to report to them, I feel best where I am right now. Any less I have issues anymore, I start getting issues. This is my sweet spot. This is yep. this is me. I had a guy There's yesterday. No doctor that can tell you that based yeah, on a lab or based on anything else. That's something that the that the patient has to report back to yeah. the doctor. I'll give you an example. I had a guy come in Friday, and he's been off his TRT for two months, but he's been off for about two years, and he's been as high as taking 300 milligrams a week just to get him to 1,200 total. And he said, I felt great at 1200 total but my provider didn't like that and they wanted me lower and we're only keeping them in the 500s and he said I felt like crap and so we're going to start him back and I'm going to start him not quite at 300 a week but probably 250 a week divided because we know in the past where he was at that dose and I've got guys that do need 300 a week just to hit even 800 total I've had that these are usually I'm bigger wondering. guys I mean it just it's all very variable on your metabolism your body weight all that stuff so but another example about the normal stuff, um, and, and it has nothing to do with testosterone, look at PSA values. You know, I see guys for elevated PSA, and a lot of primary care doctors will just see a number, oh, you're less than four, you're normal. What if they're 47 years old? It's not normal. Um, or what if it's 15? And, I, you know, I've seen plenty of guys where PSA is 15. We put them through biopsies, MRIs, over and over, and they have no cancer. And so their normal is 15. That's why I just have to tell them, like, this is your PSA. This is, this is you. It's the same thing with a lot of this stuff. You can't treat people like they're a number on a, on a piece of paper. I mean, we're, we're all individuals and symptoms matter. You know, psychiatrists treat people for depression based on symptoms and they treat them based on symptom resolution. Uh, a lot of those guys have low T actually. Um, but uh, this fascination with numbers, it just, it, it drives me crazy. Yeah. But that's a, there was a point that listed here as one of the questions where he's stating there needs to be a measurable deficiency to warrant uh, replacement therapy. And I'm like, no, I don't care what your number is. If you have all of the symptoms, you can try a trial Absolutely. of testosterone for eight weeks. And if you feel better, great. Absolutely. If you get your numbers jacked up and there's still no symptom resolution, well, guess what? Testosterone wasn't your problem to begin with. Go explore something. And Morgan Tyler said this in the latest article on questioning the guidelines about a trial of testosterone is warranted for symptoms. And I, that's exactly how I put it in my notes when I see a patient that their totals here, their free T is in the gutter. You know, all these guys come in with a free T of like five or six nanograms per deciliter and say a trial of testosterone is warranted. Testosterone is safe. We're not, we're not putting these guys on anabolic steroids. We're not getting their numbers to 3000. Like we're doing a trial of TRT and I have yet to find one that didn't feel better. Yep, agreed. Um, next one up. Every patient gets a low dose AI, aromatase inhibitor, because we're bombarded with estrogens in our environment and so on and so forth, and we've become extremely high aromatizers. And you know, high levels of estrogen will cause issues, so we need to block it, we need to keep it maintained. Mm. Uh, so, you know, titrates. Make sure that that estrogen is kept because we've got to be afraid, be very afraid. You know, Jordan, I didn't tell you, but last night I had a nightmare about estrogen. <laughs> estrogen was out to get me. I swear yeah. to God. Yeah. The but, estrogen uh, is real. It's real. It's yeah. all over the forums. Yeah. 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 I, so, uh, I may let Gail tackle first just because this could honestly be a two hour talk on, on oh, this trial. Oh, for longer. <laughs> because it's very important. And I feel like I'm the only one like, yammering about this paracrine action of estradiol, which is very clear in all the literature, and it's just a given. They're like, it's clear that estrogen is a paracrine hormone, it acts at the tissue level, and all this stuff in men, but nobody seems to get that. They're still focused on the serum level, but um, I'll let Gil talk about his experience with AIs, and oh, go ahead. Before, before Gil, I'm just gonna add one little thing, because it's just gonna give you more cannon fodder, but um, I did, a, I did a, a, a video about gyno yesterday, this is a lot of talk about, well, Danny Bossa has a little bit of gyno, which I had from like 20 freaking years ago. So obviously he doesn't know what he's talking about and he should be blocking estrogen because look at him, right? He's got this little, this little, little bit of gyno, like, oh, oh wow. Like, you know, you guys seem way more interested in it than I do. Um, 
So I said in the video that you never want to block estrogen or ext extremely rare cases you want to block estrogen. But if you are having um, the formation of tissue into the nipple, any type of hard tissue, you can try a serum like uh, tamoxifen, nolodex, or raloxifen, which will block the activity specifically at the breast receptor without really having too much of an effect anywhere else in the body because you want the estrogen to have those benefits. This physician chimed in on the, on the channel saying, you're talking about not blocking estrogen, yet you're talking about tamoxifen, which is the biggest contradictory thing you could possibly say. And then all these icons of like laughing with tears coming out. Yeah, I saw it and it's been removed. Thankfully, we yeah. screenshotted it. Um, yeah, I think maybe somebody went to see him and say, um, well, using an AI and using a serum is not yeah. the same? Yes. We oh, it. it's not? Oh, yeah, maybe I should delete that. Yeah. So, Gil, yeah. I'm going to live with this all right. to you. Did you, I don't know if it was just me, but did you notice Jordan's complexion turn bright red the minute you said the word estrogen? I think he wants <laughs> yeah. me to go first so he can step out for some air. Um, <laughs> um, I'm going to leave, I'm gonna leave Jordan, more of the American okay. discussion. I'm going to leave more of the uh, paracrine discussion to him, being that he's the one that first posted all the papers about that. But um, I want to touch on a couple of things. First off, you mentioned gyno. So just I know that's always the first thing that pops into the minds of people, especially guys in the, in the performance uh, arena of androgens. They're always worried about gyno. You need the anastrozole to block the estrogen. The evil estrogen is going to cause gyno. Gyno requires specific things, okay? And estrogen is the least of them. It requires a genetic predisposition, first and foremost. I've personally had my estrogen, my sensitive estradiol, over 100 for an extended period. Not only did I feel great, I've never once had an ounce of a gyno symptom there. Um, it needs a genetic predisposition, number one. Number two, it requires a state of low androgens. Guys who are running these steroid cycles and developing gyno do not do this on cycle. This occurs when they're coming off into a PCT when their androgens tank, but all of the metabolites lag behind. So this is something that they have to note. Also, it requires an elevated level of IGF-1, okay? If you don't have an elevated IGF-1, you don't have a genetic predisposition, you don't have a low state of androgens and an elevated level of progestins, you're not going to develop gynecomastia. It's extremely rare to develop. And all these guys starting TRT saying, oh, I'm feeling sensitivity in my nipples. This is then hormonal change. This is your body finding homeostasis. Your androgens are coming up. Your DHT and estrogen have not fully caught up yet. And it's going to be a couple of months before that goes away. It is not gynecomastia. It's completely different. So just something to note that there. I know many guys who come in have never touched a hormone in their life and they're coming in with gyno, and it's due to low T and a genetic predisposition. Um, as far as estrogens, we know the benefits. In fact, the estrogenic benefits are so great to your overall health and longevity, bone mineral density, sexual function, libido, erections, uh, muscle growth, metabolism. Okay, guys say, oh, you're going to retain water and you're going to gain fat. No, low estrogen, you're going to gain fat. Optimal estrogen levels, you're actually going to have an easier time losing fat. Um, I remember in my last show, um, I went in, I think my total, my, my sensitive E2 was in the 60s, three weeks out from contest. Um, never used an aromatase inhibitor, ever. The amount of damage that the drug itself does, secondary to lowering your estrogen, just the drug itself, the, the dyslipidemia that it causes, a reduction in HDL and increase in LDL, uh, joint pain, okay, you're drying out your synovial fluid, you're more susceptible to injury, uh, you're destroying your brain and your heart health. Uh, There's so many things that I'll let Jordan touch on on that, but estrogen is so damn important that even guys who are using other compounds for performance purposes that are not designed for, for humans are still using a base of testosterone for what reason? if not for aromatization purposes, because they're lacking estrogen from these other compounds, and some of them actually act as an aromatase inhibitor in and of themselves, they're supplementing testosterone as a base strictly for the purposes of making estrogen. And being a self-regulated hormone, why would you wanna go in there and then block the production of the very benefit that testosterone gives you? This makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. So we only wanna block it a little bit. optimal optimal ratio. A little bit, one milligram a day. That's it. it That's it. it. One milligram like a day of an estrogen. Doesn't work like that. So, um, hang on, real quick. I'm gonna close the door. Okay. Thank you. I told you he was getting heated. Oh man, you got me worked up. Sorry. 
some little you chicken. I just wanted leg. to show the calves on the way to the door. Yeah, I got no calves. It, it, it <laughs> never happened. So you have no calves? No. I won't show you mine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they're better than they used to be. I work them about four days a week, but they're still, anyway, that's another topic. Explain um, to the class, please, Jordan, the fact that E2 is a paracrine hormone. I just explain yeah. it in simple we English. To, we probably need to this make This particular physician that doesn't. They, they, most people can't seem to wrap his brain around it. I, I didn't know this until I started looking into it. I knew AIs caused issues. I had a gut feeling they were bad. I did it to myself. So it's sort of all anecdotal. And you always read these posts about crashing estrogen with AIs. And you, it's over and over and over again every day. And so I finally started looking into aromatase, its functions, estradiol in men. And the minute I started looking into local estradiol biosynthesis, how is estrogen made in men? Okay, especially men on TRT. So in, in a eugenatal man, not on TRT, only 15% of estrogen is made in the testes, okay? And that gets pumped out into the serum, only 15%. The rest is made in the tissues via aromatase. Aromatase exists everywhere in different amounts. So brain, bone, penis, endothelial, um, everywhere. Fat cells, you know, people freak out about adipose and aromatase. But the thing is, you don't know what the weighted average is of how much each tissue is contributing to estrogen. So then you start looking into, okay, what do the serum levels mean in men? And these papers all spell it out. Serum levels in men are almost meaningless. They're, they're a, a tiny reflection of basically what I'm calling, it's like estrogen just, just kind of leaking out of the tissue. And that's what you're picking up in the serum. You're not picking up, I mean, it's going to be hundreds fold greater in the target tissue. But what happens when you block aromatase? You block it everywhere. Every one of those tissues where you need it, you're blocking it. It's not selective. You're not selecting it. And what, what, what difference would it make if you were selecting it? You don't, you don't know when you're supposed to be blocking aromatase. Um, so these guys that get so caught up on their blood estrogen levels, number one, a lot of them are getting the wrong test because they're testing this total estrogen and they're getting estrone, estriol, estradiol, which is you know, a whole different issue. But even the ultra sensitive tests, you're just getting a glimmer of what's actually going on, you know, at the tissue level. It's the same with DHT. DHT is a paracrine hormone. This means it is made in the tissues itself. What you're picking up in the blood is just leaking out from the tissues. They've done studies on the prostate and the, the I don't know if it's a hundred, a thousand time fold greater DHT levels in the prostate than what you're picking up in the serum. And another study I posted recently that even prostatic DHT is not even contributing much at all to the serum DHT. It's the same with estrogen. So, and then you start looking into these studies with uh, guys who have aromatase deficiency. And then you start looking into these studies with aromatase knockout mice. And, and just, you put all these things together and you realize the key is the paracrine action. And people, I don't think they get this yet. It is key. I mean, it changed my whole world when you start reading this going, Estrogen is made in the tissues. It's acting in the tissues. It's not, people think they inject testosterone and it just converts to estrogen out in their bloodstream. It doesn't. It converts in the brain at a certain amount, converts in your fat cells at a certain amount. And, you know, I talked to somebody the other day. I said, let's say you did block aromatase because you thought too much was coming out of your adipose. You don't know how much. What's the weighted average? What's the con contribution in your serum from your adipose versus what's being made in your endothelium? You don't know. So you're just hoping that by blocking something that you shouldn't be blocking, that you're going to reduce this number in the blood that's meaningless. So anyway, and this doctor, like I said, we could talk about that for hours. So I was trying to condense that and I, I did a poor job of it. But he talks about these uh, environmental toxins and xenoestrogens, which are a concern. Those, those aren't increasing aromatization. Aromatization is happening via aromatase in the tissues. These are acting like CIRMs. These are acting like estrogen receptor modulators. And so that's a whole different issue. And they're, in fact, I would say those guys need more testosterone to make more actual estradiol to overcome the harm of these environmental toxins. Um, so that's, that's, I think he's kind of mixing up things a little bit there. So that's, uh, it's just a big deal. It really is. I, get, I, I know I hammer on it and people think I'm like the estrogen guy like I love it like it, it's not the same I'm not advocating people go out and take estrogen if you're taking estrogen and on top of testosterone yeah you're going to get probably an imbalance there at some point um, although I will say there are guys on steroid cycles who would benefit from taking estrogen 
because of what the extra crap they're taking. They're taking low testosterone and all these other compounds that are blocking aromatization. They actually need more estrogen, but how much, I don't know, because the serum levels, we don't have a good idea of where those should be in a man because they're not really contributing to action. So anyway, That's I just a big argument, uh, Jordan, the guys that do comments on these, on some of the stuff that we post is, well, if estrogen is so great, how come we're not just taking estrogen? How come we're not just supplementing with estrogen? And I'm like, but you let estrogen fall where it may that the body, body is in a balance. You yeah. don't want to purposely lower it because right. you'll have issues right. and you don't want to purposely raise it. Huh. And I've, you know, I've seen very often guys on HCG that they get this spike in estradiol. Is it estradiol on its own bad? No, but if you're spiking it unnecessarily, the fluctuations, it's just yeah. killing off that, that ratio. This doctor claims that uh, spiking estradiol uh, with HCG is very rare. I call BS on that. I've seen that many, many times. Guys get off HEG and their estradiol goes down. I'm like, oh, you've got a better ratio. But then they're like, yeah, but I thought estradiol was good. Now it's gone down. Yeah, but. The issue with HCG is the, um, and I've only found one paper on this because I've looked, is the time course of the spike in testosterone versus the spike in estrogen, and they're not matched. So you get like a 24 hour spike of testosterone, but it's two days before estrogen spikes. Again, is that really causing that big of an issue because the serum levels aren't really that accurate? I don't know, but it's interesting that there's a difference in the time course, so that may be affecting something in the tissues at a different level as well, and why a lot of guys don't feel better on it. But this notion of, of keeping estradiol in this magic range is crap. It's just crap because of, if you understand where estrogen is made in men, postmenopausal women are the same. Premenopausal, they're pumping it out from their ovaries. It's, it is acting as an endocrine hormone at that point because the circulating estradiol is attaching the receptors and functioning, but it, it's not like that in the, the rest of us. In men on TRT, you've shut down that 15% that was coming from your testicles, so all your estradiol is coming from aromatase in the tissues because you are shut down at the gonad. So this level that you're measuring, you're just getting an idea of how leaky somebody's tissue, and we don't know which one might be. It's the same with PSA in the prostate. That measurement of PSA is from, from PSA leaking out of the prostate. And a lot of guys have a leakier prostate and their PSAs are higher. Can you see that in cancer? Yeah, but can you see it in benign stuff? Yeah. So the, the number is really not that meaningful. It's what's going on down deep, you know? And anytime these guys start using an AI, we see it all the time, even on little dose, and they can take it one time and they're commenting the next few days about how, oh, my libido's off. What happened? And, and, and they'll sort of put in there, I took an AI, but they're not even putting it together. But that's what caused it. So anyway, it's, we see it right and left. And this, I don't know, like I said, that, that should be a separate video at some point. Sure, Danny, one more, one more point to make. One more point to make. This can relate to estradiol, this can relate to PSA, and PSA being far more transient than estradiol. Um, when you take a lab uh, or a blood draw, this is a snapshot in time. This is like hitting pause in the middle of a movie, looking at that screenshot and trying to assess what that movie's about. Um, you're essentially, you're essentially um, re-dosing your protocols and your frequency and your doses based on a snapshot in time, which has so many variables that are possibly not even related to your treatment. These variables can be sleep, they could be nutritional, they could be exercise, they could be stress factors. There's so many things that go into your serum testing on a given moment. Look at ALT and AST, how many people are being prescribed treatments for their liver based on a transient level of one of the two, which is not even relevant. I had a glass of wine for dinner. My, my ALT is at 80. Oh my God. Uh, yeah, I had liver. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. You know, out. and then, and then I see, I see PCPs all the time telling a guy something's wrong with, with your liver because his ALT is double the normal range. You know, the guy, the guy's got protein from, from, from working out or it's just mind blowing how they're taking these snapshots of labs and they're not even trending them over the course of years. They're just saying, based on today, here's what you should do for the next six months. And this is why symptom resolution in most aspects, unless you have an acute disease that needs to be treated today, when you're looking at lifelong treatments, symptom resolution is where it's at. The labs are just a snapshot to make sure that you're not causing harm. That's it. I'd say symptom resolution and then getting people to mod modify their lifestyle. If they have early signs of fatty liver or insulin resistance, and all these things, They've got to do that too, you know, and I know we talk about that with people all the time, get your insulin resistance under control, get in the gym, eat right. I mean, you got to do all that stuff. You can't take testosterone and 
and still be morbidly obese and be healthy? I mean, are you and healthy? People don't understand why when they're insulin resistant and they begin a testosterone regimen, why their libido is not better, why their erections are not better. Well, your SHBG is in single digits. Right. Okay. And they say, well, what's that? Well, you just told me you spent six months at your primary or your endo getting all these tests done and you don't know what SHBG is. All right now we have a whole nother problem. We have to re-educate the guy the right way. Um, and, and again, what are we trying to manage here? We're trying to manage your SHBG and your free testosterone. Well, I never had my free testosterone run. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> you and everybody else. Again, this is why it's being done incorrectly. And this is why all these false protocols are coming out based on one number, which is mostly irrelevant. Yep. Agree. Cool. Um, this one really made me laugh. Um, this, the, <laughs> this physician makes the claim that the transcrotal cream is useless for TRT, it doesn't work. It's stupid, it's ridiculous, it's nonsense. I find that amusing because I've seen probably a couple hundred labs of guys on the transcrotal cream, and very often they have to lower their dose because they're getting up into the 2000s of total T that they were just never achieving with injections for whatever reason. Uh, Jordan, you've got patients of your own on cream. Huh? Fill us in how useless of a, pro of, a, of, a, of a protocol that is for patients. It's, you know, number one, what does he mean when he says useless? Is he talking about symptom resolution? It's not useless for that. If it works in a guy, it works. Um, there are issues, and Gil feels strongly about this, and I agree with him on most of this, with sometimes with absorption, with the way it's made. I mean, that's my biggest you know, concern with the cream. But all things Let's being, make the assumption for this argument that it it's, works, a, it's a good cream compound the pharmacy that knows how to make it properly. Yeah, it, it because we have, we already know some, some right. that do that. So let's and make the patient adhere it to it. They're doing it twice a day like they're supposed to. So all these things, the stars align and they do it right. It's a good cream. Absolutely. It works. Uh, and sorry, <laughs> scared me. Uh, it works and their levels. He was saying their levels would drop after an hour. It's not true. This doesn't happen. They're, they're getting levels up. It takes four to five hours just to reach a peak. And we only had, I think, one study on the transcrotal cream. And after 16 hours, there was still 75% of it. So the, it's not like it's just spiking because it's still absorbing from the skin. You know, it takes, what, four hours just to absorb. So you're still getting this overlap. And then you do your evening application, and it keeps you pretty level. And the main thing is it works because the guys feel great. And that's what we're looking for is do you feel better? If they're deathly afraid of needles, and I know there's ways around that if you can get them accustomed to it, but if they're just, I want to use the cream and they absorb it well, it works. He made some claim, this physician, about SHBG with the cream, and it, I don't know if he was talking about it lowering SHBG. I've not seen that. In fact, I'd say, I mean, injections, especially if they're not done daily, are going to lower SHBG a little more than a daily, twice daily cream. Um, but I'm not seeing my guys on the cream have very low SHBG levels. They're all normal SHBG. Um, and, and he did say something about SHBG being a buffer and all. And I agree. SHBG has a function. It's, it does. I mean, they're, it, they've shown now it, it actually can induce, you know, attached to testosterone and attached to a megalin receptor. And that's endocytosis through the cell and it can have its own action. So yeah, SHBG is important. That's why you don't want to crush SHBG like a lot of these guys want to do. Um, but the cream works. If it work, if it works, it works. If that makes sense. Yeah. If it wasn't working, you probably wouldn't have any patients on it at this point. Absolutely. Yeah. They would say, I feel like crap, just like all these guys on these horrible injection protocols that you see from primaries or from endos. And they're taking a shot every two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, and they'll have stopped their testosterone. Cause they're like, it never worked because they, they really felt worse. I'm, I'm not seeing that on the cream unless it's not working, unless either they're not absorbing it or it's a bad batch. And that is my biggest I think concern with the cream is, is there not a standardized way that they're making it and testing every batch each time? And is the patient putting it on the same all the time? You know, are they rubbing it in long enough? So there's definitely more variables with the cream than injections. Injections work. You're going straight to the source and the muscle. I'm not a big fan of sub Q injections, although some people like them. I know Gil doesn't like them. So, um, but it, injections work. So that's, but he's wrong about what he said specifically about the cream was not true about it <laughs> spiking in an hour and then dropping off and all this stuff. And what I find interesting is like natural testosterone actually does do similar to it spikes and then falls. So if he's all about mimicking nature, I think he'd want to be doing a morning dose of cream and then nothing else. And, yeah. Yeah. Gil, what do you got to say? All right. In the short answer, yes, creams work. 
uh, for some, not for all, for some. Um, here's the slightly longer answer. I'm gonna give you the clinical, the real world, and then the scientific. Um, the only advantage I see to cream, which is a definitive advantage without debating, no one can debate it, is that it's not invasive. Nobody is going to be afraid of applying a little bit of cream on their skin like sun, suntan mm -hmm. lotion. Um, so it's not invasive, no one's gonna debate that. There are other advantages perhaps that some people can debate and some people can disagree on. But this is the only non-debatable, non-invasive, that's it. So it may work for some. Here's the problem, balancing hormones, is a very complex formula. I know we always like to oversimplify the big picture. When it comes down to individually making someone feel better and making sure that they have longevity and a lifelong period of doing this correctly, it is somewhat complex because there's a lot of variables. When you have these variables, you try to control as many of them as possible. Baby, baby crying. Yeah, no problem. You good, Danny? Nice. Keep, keep going. Keep going. Okay. I can hear you. Just you uh, sorry about that. Very right back. You have variables that you're trying to control. It's difficult to control some of them, but we're pretty efficient at doing so. When you add in more variables that are completely out of your control, you're overcomplicating an already complex formula. What are some of those variables? Adherence. Is the patient going to apply this on a daily basis or twice a day? Is the patient's thickness of their skin equivalent to what you're estimating that they're going to absorb? Is the dosing in terms of concentration, in the terms of volume, in the terms of which pharmacy mills it a certain way? All these variables are adding to an already complex equation of trying to create homeostasis. So by adding in more problems into a formula, I'm overcomplicating the formula. If I give you 100 milligrams of cream, you may absorb 20 and Jordan may absorb 80. In six months, you may only absorb 10 and he may now absorb all 100. If I give you 100 milligrams of cypionate, you're getting 100 milligrams of cypionate. So I've now eliminated a lot of variables and it gives your provider much better control over your treatments and making adjustments, number one. Number two, the biggest problem that I have seen with creams in terms of real world application is the risk associated with cross-contamination with the mandatory celibacy period of about four hours to prevent cross-contamination to your partner. If you have pets, if you have kids, um, these are all real, real concerns. I have two daughters. The last thing I wanna do is worry about that I get something on my skin or on my hands that I could transfer over to them. It takes me five minutes to do my CPNA protocol twice per week. Uh, from a clinical setting, Jordan mentioned SHBG. This is a big one. How do we adjust free testosterone to fall in that sweet spot of 2 to 2.5% two or 3% of your total? We know that in diabetic or insulin-resistant pre-diabetic patients, their SHBG tends to be low. So then we need to dose them more frequently in order to prevent the androgenic effect of crushing SHBG further. The creams do that pretty well because they have to be dosed at least once a day. What about the patients who are slightly older, have non-alcoholic fatty liver, have a existing liver condition, or maybe take some over-the-counter medication, and those patients may have SHBGs in the 70s, 80s, or 100, and they struggle to get their free T above 1.5% of their total. How do we get the free T down in those patients? Simple. We could dose them once per week with cypionate for a month to see if we can get that down and then switch them to twice a week. We can try them at twice a week. We can go three times a week. We can play with the frequency of their dosing according to how SHBG responds to the androgen injection. We cannot do that, and we lose the luxury of controlling SHBG with daily cream application. Being that that is one of the biggest factors we're trying to manage for not only health, but how the patient's ultimately going to feel, um, I think that leaves a lot on the table and it does a disservice uh, to a lot of people. So in short, again, yes, it can work. I don't think it's the optimal way to treat it. Although, if a guy is absolutely 100% against injections, like I mentioned earlier, we have an older patient with Parkinson's, the guy cannot self-inject, is his option go on cream or do nothing? Yes, by all means, go on cream. Uh, and I have a lot of guys Jordan. in that camp because they are more frail, they're older, they're trimmer, their wives don't want to inject them, 
Cream's great if it works. Like I say, um, m- most of my guys so far, it's working. Like, and I totally agree with all the points you made. That's why I haven't switched to cream. I mean, I'm, I don't want to add a ton of variables in when I know shots work. Um, what else were you saying about the SHBZ thing? I don't worry about the higher guys because we just we can overcome that with more testosterone. I mean, I know that sounds you know, increase the dose, but if you're just going for symptom resolution, you can kind of – because over time, the SHBG will fall, other things being equal, because androgens will push that SHBG down. Um, now, yeah, if they have a liver pathology or something weird, that, that could definitely be a confounder. Uh, but overall, I don't worry about the higher SHBG guys as much as I do the super low, you know, those guys. And those guys need, honestly, a daily dosing. I, would, I can't get most of those guys to do that unless they do the cream. So, like, my diabetic guys, SHBGs in the single numbers, they're going to probably feel better with a daily dosing. They don't want to do injections. So, hey, let's do the cream because you're going to get, you know, you're not going to burn through your testosterone too fast doing that. So Mm -hmm. I still think there's a lot to be learned about this. I think the whole SHBG thing is really interesting, but there hasn't been a lot of good work on, on it in guys on TRT and how it affects things. And now I said the megalin receptor is the new thing and SHBG actually does work. It actually does, you know, attach to testosterone and, and act on the cell through the megalin receptor. So maybe it's more of a megalin receptor issue than SHBG. So it's really interesting, but uh, we got a lot, a long way to go on that. But I totally agree with you about the variables with cream. I totally do. But when it works, it does work. And it's not just an hour half life, like this guy was saying, an hour and it's gone. It doesn't, it's not like that. It's not like testosterone suspension where you got to do it four times a day and anything like that. And uh, we do know some doctors that are that use almost exclusively the cream. So I guess it'll it'll Jill brought up some really really good points there. Um, anyways, moving on to the next one. Um, so okay, so here's the one one last thing I want I want to hit. Um, this particular doctor was making claims that the TRT community in general is rather dysfunction, uh, dysfunctional. So I'd say a guy like me that will just kind of facilitate, uh, you know, meetings like this with different doctors with different perspectives. Uh, this particular physician kind of gives off the impression that he's the only one that's right and everyone else is wrong. Um, I need to make it clear to the people that watch this channel that there are certain things that I've, I'm, I've been pretty much convinced of based on evidence and some of the evidence has been so unbelievably overwhelming that there's, it'll take a, it'll be pretty difficult to change my mind. So potentially my mind could be changed on some of these things, but it's going to take a lot of work. And there's other things I'm very, very open to. There's other things I'm, I'm completely sure of. Um, but there's one thing I don't have is, A, I'm not a doctor. I don't have a clinic. I don't have any business interests in TRT whatsoever. Yes, I have a YouTube channel with my partner, Stephen Devos. Uh, are we making millions of dollars off this YouTube channel? No. Uh, Stephen Devos has a, a very, is a very successful doctor. He's a dermatologist in Belgium. I'm a successful businessman here in Montreal. Neither of us need the money, I can assure you. And with our Peasley 6,000 subscribers here on YouTube, trust me, we're, there's like a couple hundred bucks coming in to pay for Zoom and microphones and lighting and webcams and all this type of stuff. But that's pretty much it. All I want and Stephen wants is... Let's get information that is the most accurate possible. Let's get a number of different physicians to come on, experts in the field to share their experience, and we can share it with everybody else. Uh, we're not following any one physician. Uh, we're not following any one strategy or any one way of thinking, if you will. Uh, I, I, I have to say I was guilty of that in the past when I was first starting out that there was one physician in particular that was kind of like dominating the uh, the arena, so to speak, but I've, I've, I've kind of evolved now past that. Um, and, you know, Jordan, we get, you know, a guy like you that comes on. I'm not saying everybody, you got to go see Jordan Grant, go to his website and go to here. He's just here to have a talk. Gil, I haven't even brought up Gil's clinics, okay? Maybe you guys can look him up if you really want to, think you like what he has to say, but I'm not trying to, like, push any of you towards any one person. All I want is the sharing of, of, of information where people can come in and say, I know this to be true based on this evidence or based on I've been able to demonstrate and so on and so forth. But when you get one person on the internet who is a, a doctor and is a physician and is obviously very desperate to get patients to go on and say, all these people are wrong, they're all morons, they're all dummies, I know what I'm talking about and I've read the literature. And then here we are with our own studies and our own literature that keep contradict what he's saying. 
that he's never really brought up anything to warrant, in my opinion, any, any, to even just believe anything he's saying. He sent me uh, studies on rights, on rice and on mat, uh, on rats and claims that they're important. But I'm like, we have 80, over 80 years of research in men. Why do I need to see studies on rice and mats, uh, in m- mice and rats? I like uh, rice sorry, and I keep saying ri- <laughs> mice and r- rice, <laughs> rice and mats. That's my, my espresso. Mat, mat. Uh, it's worn off. <laughs> mats make a lot of estrogen. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> rice, rice and mats. I, um, I, um, I, I want to touch on what you're saying because we have an awesome group and we don't all agree. I mean, we disagree openly all the time with certain topics. And that's awesome because that's what we're about is, hey, let's post the literature and let's look at the literature. Is this a good study? Is it not? And I'm guilty of, you know, not knowing. I'm not a statistician, you know, and we got to tease through a lot of this stuff and figure out, is it, is it well done? We got a lot of awesome guys in the group. We disagree about hematocrit. Uh, we disagree about anabolics and their safety levels and all this stuff. Uh, different doctors you guys have had on the YouTube channel that I don't agree with that where they say something and I go, Hmm, it's okay. Disagreement's a good thing. You know, it's, it's worse when you just have one closed minded group that's that, you know, anybody comes in with a different opinion, they kick them out. That's not what you've done. People are like, Oh, he kicks people out left and right. It's when they're being a holes. It's not when they're questioning something. And that's, you're right as a moderator to do that. All of us we're moderators in the group. If somebody starts being belligerent, you're done. Like you didn't read the rules, you know, this whole argument against you not being a doctor. It's not really from this doc saying that I don't think, but from a lot of the people that like him, well, Danny's not a doctor. So who listens? Look at freaking Nelson from Excel mail. He's not a doctor. He's put out some, some great stuff and helped guys over the years, you know, just cause people need to quit putting doctors on pedestal. And I'm saying this as a doctor because I don't put them on a pedestal and I don't put myself up there. They're wrong a lot. And, you know, I see these guys in some of the groups are like, I just do what my doc tells me. I'm like, why? What, why? Well, you feel like crap. Why don't you look into this? And that's what I want all the guys in our group. And I posted this, you know, in a big thing. Look into everything you're ever told. Look in, just always examine it. Don't believe what I say. Don't believe what you say. Don't believe what your preacher tells you. Go, you know, whatever it is, you're, you're a professor that you're in class and you just buy what they say. Even a textbook may say it. Go look it up. Go look at the references where they, you know, and that's what I've started doing with these studies is start looking at the references and go dig into those papers and really look and examine everything because none of us are going to be 100% right. We don't have perfect knowledge, um, but, but don't believe everything we say. But for this guy to act like we're dysfunctional, I mean, he's the one who's got spies in the group and, you know, and I mean, we're not really doing that. Kind of, I'm not, I mean, I don't know. I, I couldn't care less. I mean, I'm a member of multiple TRT groups and, I mean, there's different opinions about stuff. So that's great. You know, it's good. You know, I, I don't know. So. The only reason I've done, I'm doing this particular video right now to pick apart some of the, some of the nonsense he's been saying is uh, he, takes, he takes screenshots of stuff we say or picks apart stuff in the videos and just says they're all morons. Everyone there is a, is a moron. And I've invited him to appear here. And I said, well, why don't we have a friendly debate? Let's just put our little you know, silly internet quarrel behind us and come on and you can demonstrate what you're saying is true and why, and you can debate me. And, and if I'm too inferior as a non-physician, I'll bring on physicians instead. I'll put them in my place and I'll just sit back and eat, eat some popcorn and you guys can talk it out. And he's like, no, 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 no. He says, you're not important enough. Uh, you're not worth my time. Yeah, Meanwhile, he's on Reddit you're, uh, you're a and typing away furiously. What was it? You're the Chihuahua and he's the German Shepherd. Yes, yes. And he says, I'm a German Shepherd and you're a oh, Chihuahua. That's very professional. So. Yeah, extremely professional. But he's got so much time to have fake profiles in our group, comments, go and share, like, look what I wrote, like, look what they said, and going on Reddit and comments on YouTube and on and on and on and on. He's got time for that. Yet when I say, come on and, you know, let's have a, a face-to-face discussion and you can demonstrate and maybe I'll listen to this guy and he'll make some valid points and say, holy shit, like, you've got a point. I never thought of it that way. Cool. Or he'll say, hey, I got the study here. I'll send it to you. I'll look at it. Like, wow, you've got a point. I just learned something. Yeah, great. Let's but he refuses to do yeah. so. Yeah. So that's why I'm here because it's silly. Anybody that disagrees with me or Jordan, Gil, 
I know they can contact us on a moment's notice and say, hey, I highly disagree with you and I have evidence to back you up. Perfect, come on and let's have a discussion. We'll share this and it'll be interesting. Yep. But if you're just gonna say we're wrong and you will decline any opportunity to, to demonstrate why we're wrong, I just find it silly. I find it silly. You shouldn't have made the statement to begin yes, with. You but should you have know just what, crawled what, back under your rock and just. It's okay you know, because it. it's going to, we've had more and more people every day joining the group and they're going to check out the YouTube channel. And I think they can see for themselves that we're very fair and open and evidence-based. And it, I've had a ton of people say that and message me and just talk about how much they're learning and they, stuff they've never even heard before. And again, not that we're right on everything, but at least I think it's helping people to think for themselves, I hope. And that's what, that's what I want for people is to Critical thinking. Uh, question your doctor, question the TRT guru in your forum. If you're on T nation and they're Reddit and they're saying stupid crap and oh, grow your estrogen's high. You got to take an AI. Well, I feel like crap when I take an AI. Why do I need to do that? Cause your estrogen's high, you know, it's this circuit. So, uh, Question all that crap. You know? Anything that was said here, guys, all your viewers that are watching this video, anything that was said in this, you listen to Gil, I'm listening, they're like, wow, he knows this stuff. We're going to hang up. I'm going to go check out everything he just said. I don't care how convincing he is or good looking he is or whatever it is. I'm going to go check this guy's stuff out. You know, Jordan, he's got, he's got the biceps going on and obviously his protocol is dialed in. I'm going to go check out some of the stuff that he disagreed with me to say, who's right? Was it him? Was it, I'm like, oh, well, he, he had a point. So Gil, Gil, might, Gil can talk about this dysfunctional thing because he was a mod in, in TRT for a long time, you know. And yes. Whether I mean, yeah, there's dysfunction everywhere, but he, he can probably speak to this better than I could. Danny, there is, um, there's two roads, two roads that I see. So you're, you're driving down and you, you can make a right or you can make a left. If you make the right, then your priority is your ego and your own pedestal and your own name. If you make the left, then your priority is essentially the – promotion of the industry as a whole and helping guys feel better and putting out correct education and keeping your mind open and learning from others and understand that none of us know it all. And this is still a relatively infant of a topic in the modern world of medicine, right? I mean, there's not that much out there compared to the hundreds and hundreds of years of modern medicine. There's, you know, not, not a whole lot with regards to what it is that we're doing these days. Uh, and there is also a big lobby to kind of shove it under the rug for you know, political and financial reasons. So if you want to turn right and kind of worry about your ego, then what you're going to do is you're going to go out there and you're going to say, I understand all the signs you're giving me. I understand all the logic you're making and I understand everything that you're saying. And while it makes sense on the surface, I am not going to dig an ounce deeper because I don't like your credentials. So you're completely discounting everything and all the evidence based on the individual who sourced it Logical. while chances are that source came from other sources because we weren't born with the knowledge. It came from, in my case, experience. It came from guys like Jordan. It came from, from guys like Nelson. It came from guys who put the information out there and then also reading all of the trials that have been done and then dealing with hundreds, if not thousands of patients firsthand. So all of this information, it's very easy to point at us and say, well, you're not a physician, therefore keep your mouth shut because I want to pound my chest and have my ego. Or you could go down the left road and say, let me take what this guy is saying because there is an ounce of logic to it and let me dig a little deeper and then let me come back and state, do I still disagree with your point and here is why? Or, you know what, some of these points you made open my eyes and I do like them. Thank you for the information. Let's join forces and research a little further so we can fight the real enemy, okay, which is those trying to completely eliminate the industry and keep guys on antidepressants, cholesterol medication, blood pressure medication, keep you as a diabetic, and that teach you how your, your insulin sensitivity has a direct role on your hormones and sexual function. So we can either educate people together, or we can bicker about it and call each other names and try to elevate our own status. It really comes down to our personal choice. And uh, sadly, uh, like Jordan said, I mean, recently I, I – I came to light that, you know, some people who I had the utmost respect for, for a long period of time, unfortunately seem to choose that right turn instead of the left turn. And that's okay. I hold no grudges. Um, I continue to do what I'm doing because I want to educate people. Um, this is not about go see this guy, or come to my clinics. Again, we're not naming the clinics because this video is not about generating revenue. This video is about putting out education and it is about furthering this industry. There are probably... 200 men in America. I think less than 3 million of them are currently being treated for androgen deficiencies. 
of those 3 million, I'd venture a guess that 75% are not being treated optimally. There is a huge, huge potential within our industry. And every year it grows exponentially. So I think by putting out education, um, this isn't about keeping some proprietary secrets that we know and we hope no one else finds out about because we wouldn't be doing this. I can only pray that every physician and every provider out there um, takes some of this information, does their own research, reaches out to people who are out there pushing this agenda the right way and actually learns so they could take better care of their own patients and step off that ego platform and stop saying, I'm not going to listen to that guy because you know, he doesn't have some diploma to hold up. Jordan can tell you, they don't teach any of this in med school. They really don't. And if they did, you wouldn't have this example of so many providers doing it incorrectly. It's a disservice to men. I know the word, the word malpractice gets tossed around often, and I know it's a strong word, um, but it is quite honestly a disservice to go and take on a role that you have no understanding in based on just what you've read on Google, a lot of these guys will literally go on Google after a patient comes in and say, oh, this seems like the normal, let's try it. And they'll just make a patient a guinea pig. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's just, it's poor medicine. It really is. So look, if I have a heart attack, I'm not gonna run to my dentist just because he's a doctor. This is not what he does. Your primary care physician does not treat hormones. Your endocrinologist generally will specialize in diabetes, and thyroid, some of them will do hormones correctly, most of them will not, and it's a shame. And I don't say this with disdain, I say this in the hope that many of them further their education outside of the textbook. Uh, that's, uh, Gil's like a wordsmith, because everything he just said, well, man, I can't top that at all. Um, but he's right, yeah. I mean, we're trying to help people here. I mean, the, we, we don't do this for money, we're giving out, <laughs> the amount of messages we get on Facebook is insane. And the amount of posts that we try to help people. I mean, my wife's just driving her crazy because I'm on my phone now all the time. I'm probably going to have to cut back a little bit because I, I, it's probably a pathology on my part. I do want to help people. I, I love this stuff. I'm passionate about it. And I want, I want guys to get treated correctly. And so that's why I love seeing these guys that do come from hours away and they're on these horrible protocols and they feel horrible and we just tweak a few things and they're like a new person in, you know, three months. And, it's very satisfying. That's why we do it. But it's not about the money. I'm on, I'm on salary. You know, I'm fine. I mean, I'm, I'm a urologist. I do surgeries. I do a lot of other stuff besides hormones. This is, I guess, a hobby. Um, it's a passion. You know? yeah. I just want to add one thing uh, for everyone watching that, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk to say, you know, Danny's always stuck in his ways and he only does this one thing. He doesn't want to listen to reason. I'm going to give you one little quick example that just occurred in this video. Um, like I said, there was a physician we used to have on often before who was, you know, the cream, the cream, the cream is best, and you get the DHT boost, and guys are feeling better, and we're getting their numbers way up higher than anything we could have achieved with Cipian, and it's so good. Jordan, you got into that stuff too. You started prescribing cream. You do have a lot of patients doing extremely well on cream, you know, uh, and I have a lot of people tell me I switched to the cream, it's better, and it's great, okay? So in my mind, cream is equal to, in some cases, perhaps even better than injections. That's all I've ever seen. Now we got Gil on, and Gil's like, well, it's good in some cases, but I've seen cases of this and this. And he went on to explain everything in high detail. And I'm like, oh, I've never thought of that perspective before. This other physician just says, the cream's nonsense. It's stupid, it's this, this, that, dismiss it. I, you know, give me strength. He, uh, he phrased it, he says, give me strength. It's just stupid. But Gil made some very legitimate claims here that I'm like, logically, yeah. that makes sense to me. Absolutely. I'm going to go look into this. And on the next video, I might come up and say, you know, um, I have to say that my position is some people could do well on cream, but I think most will probably do better on injections based on everything I've just looked at now. So anybody here can, can, is in a position to change my mind. But if you're going to make an extraordinary claim, you're going to have to back it up with some kind of extraordinary evidence to change my mind. And, I, and you, you can change my mind, just like you can change any other minds here. I am not stuck in any one way. If I get the better answer, I'm going to say, guys, I used to have this answer. This is now my new best answer. I want to share it with you, everybody. And until somebody comes along and demonstrates that they have an even better answer than this, yeah. this is what I'll be saying. And that's it. So critical sure. thinking, look into this stuff. I Don't agree. just take everything as truth. Right. Andy, can I put myself out there for one second and actually show a little bit of weakness? Um, we used to try to manage serum estradiol in men 
not with an AI, which I always opposed, but by cutting back on their dose a little bit, if we felt that they're quote unquote symptomatic for high estrogen. After reading some of the papers that Jordan sent me about six months ago and having some conversations with him, we've done a 180 on that, and we no longer worry about the serum estradiol levels. So there's always room to learn. There is never a position where you're going to take the high horse and say, this is it, and you don't know what you're talking about. If the evidence is there, you research it, you come to a conclusion, and you run with it. And, and, and there's no harm in giving credit for somebody who opened your eyes to it. The harm is essentially done to the patients that you're caring for when you're just closing your eyes and saying, I'm the best, don't tell me what to do. So just a point there that, uh, look, I have, we, I have physicians that come to me asking me to manage their hormones. I have physicians that come to me to ask me to manage their nutrition or their training protocols um, without ego. And this is the people who make the best progress. Again, I don't have an issue. When I competed, I hired coaches. I coach people on nutrition and recomposition and hormones. I hired my own coaches, and it wasn't so much for knowledge as it was for accountability. But at the end of the day, I needed someone to hold me accountable. Someone may need someone else to hold them accountable or give them an ounce of education. We all have to rely on people around us to help us progress. And when you get out of your own ego, that is the only way forward. Love it. Well, well said. Guys, to all you watching this video, we are going to be having Gil back on uh, next week. Uh, it'll be another uh, pretty interesting talk. He's got all kinds of stuff he wants to talk about. Gil, this is really, really cool. Uh, I, was, I was pleasantly surprised with everything he had to say. Uh, not that I thought you were going to be like, <laughs> whatever you uh, Jordan, uh, always a pleasure. Uh, guys, to all of you watching, lots of great content. We're going to keep putting out lots of great content. Uh, without anybody paying me to do it. And uh, <laughs> like we're just saying in this video, uh, if you haven't already subscribed, please do so. Click that subscribe button, click that bell button to get notified whenever time we put out a new video. And I promise you we're gonna have a lot more really interesting discussions on these, uh, on these topics. Guys, again, thank you very much. Uh, super appreciate it. Uh, it was a great talk. I really, really liked it. Thank Absolutely. you both for your time. Yeah, thanks both of you guys. Okay. Thanks for having us, Danny. Pleasure.